Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on in. Let's, let's get in. Let's get ready. Hallelujah. Hope you came with a heart ready, hungry. If you're here tonight, you are, you are those who are hungering and thirsting after th more of God. And so it's been such a wonderful three services, and uh, tonight's our, our finale. And uh, I believe the Lord has something exact for us tonight. So let's, uh, let's enter into the presence of the Lord. Father, we just bless you tonight. Lord, we begin right now, Father. We set the thermostat of the evening, God. Lord, we set it, God, on Holy Spirit. Lord, we set it, Father, on, on making sure that we're tuned in with what you're saying and with what you're speaking. Lord, don't let us miss anything, God, that, we, that you have for us. Lord, we've come hungry for you, Lord. We've come to honor you, Lord. We say more, Lord, more, God, tonight. More of your presence, God. More revelation, more of who you are. And God, then let us leave this house, God, and live it, God. Let us be a demonstration of what you've done, Father, these four services. Lord, bless our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Just take a moment and just 
just you and Jesus, just tell him what you're trusting him for right now. Just tell him, I'm trusting you, Lord, for my family. I'm trusting you for my health. Lord, I'm trusting you for a miracle. God, I'm trusting you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I walk not by sight, Lord, but by faith. Come on. We're trusting the Lord. Hallelujah. Your word, Father God, it never returns void, God. Your word, God, hallelujah, Lord, is sharper than any two-edged sword, God. Your word, Father, will perform that which it would sent to do, God. Your word, Father planted deep in our hearts, God. We trust you, Jesus. We declare our allegiance to you, fresh and new. Have your way, God, in our hearts and lives tonight. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Well, before you see it, would you just greet just a few people? Tell them you're glad to see them in the house tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good to be in church tonight. Good to be with God's people, God's house. And, uh, man, what a, what a great week we've had. And uh, I'm so appreciative of, of the word of the Lord, what God has uh, been teaching us and imparting into us, what Dr. Rob has brought to this house. Are you, are you thankful for the ministry of Dr. Rob McCorkle? Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he is, um, has a passion for the things of the Lord. I love the fact that um, he's not winding down, but he's cranking up. Come on, somebody. And so his, his passion for the things of God and to hunger for God. How I many know that, that never wanes? Amen. Our hunger for God never, never dissipates, and so we continue to seek the Lord. And so uh, this is our last night. We will receive an offering tonight. Before the last thing we'll do tonight, and so one, one more offering just to bless him and him in this ministry, a fire school ministries. And so, would you uh, take a moment and greet Dr. Rob McCorkle as he comes to the pulpit tonight? Amen. I love you, brother. I love you. Thank you. It's always such an honor when a uh, pastor hands you the mic. It really is. It's a tremendous responsibility. And, man, I never take that lightly. It, it's an honor to be in your house. And uh, it almost makes me want to cry. It's just, it's just a tremendous blessing. Thank you so much. I, uh, I believe I met Gary and Kimber. I'm, I was thinking tonight during worship about seven years ago maybe in Evansville. And a group of pastors used to gather together. It had to be 30 at least. Guys and gals that would cry out for, uh, for uh, the power of God to fall on Evansville. And that's where I, I believe I met um, this couple. You ever meet someone and just say, I, I think we could probably do life together. You know what I'm saying. I mean, there's some people you meet, they're wonderful. It's just they're just two ships passing by each other and you wave, right? And it's nothing, it's not bad. But then there's others you could say, man... I, I want that guy in my corner, and, and, I, and I think uh, Gary and Kimber would be that couple. And so we bless you guys. Thank you so much. Bill, it was such an honor to meet you too, and you and Connie. Bless your hearts, and you have welcomed us in, in so much. And Amy and Kevin, 
Where did you guys go? Thank you so much for the worship. Thank you. There you are. Yeah, that's right. I should have known you always sit there. Everyone sits in the same place. That's how pastors take attendance. Oh, yeah. yeah. Someday you ought to just switch it all up and mess him up, man. Just. But anyway, thank you, Amy, for doing the worship this week. Yeah, bless you guys. Come on. I mean that. So, well, um, <clears throat> if, uh, is, there, is there anyone here that did not get, oh, by the way, by the way, uh, could you put that up real quick on, on that, uh, that QR thing? Did, did you, so you know what to do with that, don't you? You don't just take a picture of it. You actually, there's a, you have an app on your phone, if you have an iPhone, I think, that allows you to go right to the YouTube channel. And I would love for you guys to be instant subscribers to, to my YouTube channel. It's all brand new. It, it's, I did 18 in a, in a studio, and we're just getting it off the ground. So it's, it's a, it's a, so if you say, well, there's things I don't like about it. Well, there's, I can't do anything about that because there's 18 of them in the can. But then we're sh- switching it. But there's a lot of uh, things that we're wanting to do in, in the days ahead. And I have fought this, but I really felt like the Lord gave me a green light because the last thing I want to do is be hindered with all this stuff, but yet I see the advantage of how this is going to be used in places and then also around the country. So if you guys would take a picture of that and become instant subscribers, and I would appreciate that. And, and then I, I did want to give away this Transforming a City workbook. We've not... We, we've done an overview and cherry-picked at it. There's no way you, we could really go through it in depth. So is there someone that just did not get a copy, would like a copy? Is there anyone that did? You, buddy? Okay, here. Here you go, my friend. Bless you. Yeah, yeah. And so um, pr- uh, the book that, that came out last, was it last year? Last year, last fall, I think is this book called Life and Death. So, Sydney and I are seven years into the longest fast we've ever fasted, and we've been fasting, grumbling, and complaining. (laughs) So I started it, I believe, in 17. You were there, weren't you? March of 17, so it's been over seven years. And I started this for a month, and I remember the church I was pastoring then, they laughed you know, and we thought it was cute, but the Lord really put his thumb in my back and said, Jesus never, ever spoke in the flesh, and I don't want you to do the same. So I have attempted in, for the last seven years to stay on a grumble fast. You know, when you're at the barber and you're around people, and it's, it's challenging because most, of, most people will, you know, Politics, sports, weather, gas prices. I just think we can be different. I just think we can speak spirit source words. We can define problems. We don't have to, you know, let that go into a grumbling. So I wrote a book on it. It's a 21 day study. There's 21 chapters, or they're short chapters with a study guide. Or you can take the study guide and it has questions for the entire week. So you can go 21 weeks. Like if you really think your spouse needs it. You know what I'm saying. But don't grumble, but don't grumble about it. Just state the fact and move on. But there are couples doing this, staff doing this. It's, it's, a, it's a one-on-one study with you and Jesus. But I really, really, really... The contents of this book are really my life that I'm attempting to live and have for seven years. So anyway, is there, is there someone that would be interested in that? Okay. Yeah. I saw your hand. Here you go, sweetie. Yeah. Yeah. I saw your hand. I saw your hand first. Bless you. So um, I'll just mention this. If uh, anyone would want to uh, partner with us, we have little partner cards. We have people that partner with us. We're a brand new start, so we don't have a lot. But if you want to partner with us, we have little partner cards back on the table, and you can fill it out and give me the top, and you keep the bottom. And we just have a few partners. 
And it, whatever God tells you, if, if you feel prompted to do that, uh, I would sure appreciate that. So we have big ideas, God ideas. We have God ideas. We really do. I, I could not be happier. I don't, I don't know how to tell you this. I, I am 61, and I feel like I've been let out of a shoebox in the middle of a parking lot. I, have, I just absolutely, I mean, we have no guarantees this thing will ever fly, but we're just loving it. We just started over. We just started over. We left a ministry that we were a part of, and, and it was all good, but it was not what Jesus wanted. And life's in the voice. Life's in the voice. And so we just took the swan dive, and I couldn't be happier. Bless you guys. You have your Bibles? I want to, I wanna, before we get to Acts 19, I want to I go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. So I'm going to summarize, if, if you do have your books, I'm going to be summarizing lesson four, the demonstration of the supernatural. <laughs> How many believe Christianity is the supernatural? It really is. Let me... Uh, Oh, if I can find this real fast. So, Reinhard Bonnke said to be, this is in your books, by the way, on page 50. Reinhard Bonnke said, to be blunt, Christianity is either supernatural or nothing at all. We had and still have a supernatural Jesus with a supernatural ministry creating a supernatural church with a supernatural gospel and a supernatural Bible. Take the miraculous away, and you have taken Christianity's life away. The church becomes an ethical society or a social club when it is intended to be a grid system for transmitting the power of God into a powerless world. <laughs> Amen. Man, that's, that's good stuff. All right, Romans chapter 6, before we get to Paul and the supernatural. But I want to look at Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Uh, verse 11. Uh, no, no uh, 6 verse um, 13, I'm sorry. Romans 6, 11 is good too. Considered shells dead and alive to Christ. But look at verse 13. Romans 6, verse 13. Romans 6, verse 13 and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. I like this, as those alive from the dead. <laughs> we're alive from the dead. Come on, somebody, we're alive from the dead. See, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. We were all dead in our trespasses and sins, but he made us alive. So, so we literally present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and then your members, and here's this word again, as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, the, the word instrument used twice there, is, is hoplon, and it's, it's, it's the word that can mean implement or weapon. In fact, I did some study on this word. This word weapon can actually mean an offensive weapon, an offensive weapon. So there's defensive weapons, and then there's offensive weapons. This here is an offensive weapon. And you and I, well, we could be an offensive weapon in the hands of the enemy. I sure was for a number of years. Or we can present ourselves to God and we can be instruments or weapons of righteousness that God can use and wield for his kingdom's sake. And, and when I think about the supernatural, when I think about where we're going to look at terms of what Paul did in Ephesus, 
And when I think of transformation, I think of the fact that you and I are weapons, we're tools in the hands of God that he can source and he can use anytime, anyplace, anywhere. And, and we become the weapons he uses to bring transaction, transformation in a community. We're weapons. We're weapons to cut down the work of darkness and to establish the kingdom of God. We're weapons that he can use. We're not weapons any longer in the hands of the enemy. We're, we're not weapons that, that destroy and hurt. No, we're weapons that heal. We're weapons that restore. We're, we're weapons that are used to, to, to set captives free, man, to, to release prisoners. We're, we're weapons used to raise the dead, to cast out devils, whatever, man. We're weapons. You and I are weapons. I'm going to say this. You haven't heard this. Check this out. You guys are dangerous. Every one of you. You're, I'm just telling you. you, you are, you're dangerous people. You, 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 in the hands of God, you're lethal. And, and I said this Sunday, you are God's best hope for city transformation. Oh, if we'd only grasp that. There's not a plan B. There's not a plan B. So... Anyway, look at then Acts 19, Acts chapter 19, and, and we'll hone in on just a few verses here. So last night we looked at verses 8 and 9, 10, and then we, we looked at the outspill of that in 17, 18, and 19, and, 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 and 20 is just, just phenomenal, the city transformation. But right in the heart of this is, is, are these verses that are just incredible. And we're going to land in, in, in a jiffy on 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12. But, but I want to read 11. I want to just, let me just read this. And verse 11, God was performing. Listen to this language. And again, I'm reading from the NASB. Any translation is fine. Verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs and aprons were carried from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted, attempted, that's, that's a key word there, attempted. Is that, yeah, oh, you need it, yeah. The NASB has the word attempted. Now, some of your Bibles would say, took it upon themselves. Took it upon themselves. And that, that's a great translation, actually, because that's exactly what that word means. The word there, attempted, is just that. It's a word to take in hand. In other words, I, I am, I'm coming up with this idea this is my doing. This is what we call self-sourced ministry. And the antithesis of spirit-sourced ministry is this word right here. It's self-sourced ministry. It's, it's the kind of thing where we're going to get together in a little committee, in a little group, and we're going we're to conjure up some ideas. We're going to come up with something. We're going we're gonna to do a program that sounds good. We saw that church down there do that. Wow, come on, let's do that, man. And so that's self-sourced ministry. And, and I, I got to tell you, the demise of the church in this hour is self-source ministry. It's self-sourcing. It's, it's the problem in America is people waking up, living for themselves. And, and I, but I expect that in people who are blind and deaf and dead spiritually. But I am appalled when that happens in the church. When you got people in the church who are self-sourced and come up with you know, this, this idea of what we can do and what we're going to pull off and what we're going to attempt. And, and I got to tell you, when you use that kind of method in response to the devil, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're, you ever read the book by John Paul Jackson called Needless Casualties to War? But he talks about just throwing hatchets into the dark, man. And, and these people that go into cities and they start binding principalities and, and, and you know, demonic. He says, you have no authority to do that. 
You know, Jesus didn't just walk into Jerusalem and start binding stuff. Man, stop all that stuff. You, what gives you the authority to go into a city that isn't your city? Now, let's see, this is your city, but you need to be employed by the Holy Spirit when you take on demonic assignments. You cannot, you can't just go after this stuff in the flesh. It's not anything to mess with. Now, if you're being sourced by the Spirit of God, those things ain't got a chance. I, I, had, a, I had a fella come into my church when I was pastoring, and he came in, he was sitting on the front seat, and, and it's just him and me. It's on a Monday afternoon, probably 2.30. We're just talking, and, 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 I'm, and I get a word of knowledge that this guy, this guy is hindered by a perverse spirit that he's just, I saw him just all tethered and tied to this stuff. Then I looked at him and I said, you got a perverse spirit that needs to be severed off you, brother. He fell on all fours and started growling like a dog. It's just like a dog. I mean, I, it was, I didn't, I was like, you know, my first thought was like, yeah, can I call Cindy? Well, I, like, I never had any class on seminary dealing with a manifestation of someone growling like a dog. The guy's just growling. I mean, it was hideous, guttural, this growl. But then I thought, now wait a minute. I am blood-bought, blood-washed, spirit-filled. I get my cues not from that but from him, from the Father. And I just leaned back into his presence, and I said, in my spirit, I said, Father, what, you know, what are we going to do here? And he says, command that thing to leave. Now I heard a word from the heavens. And I, and I literally commanded that thing to leave, man. And it's not pretty. None of that stuff, I don't enjoy that. None of that stuff's pretty. I don't relish any of that. I relish the freedom. I don't like that. But I had the authority. Why? Because I was commissioned in that moment. Furthermore, that thing came into our church. That thing came into, listen, that was a demon that crossed hairs with me. I didn't pick a fight. It came into our house. And the Spirit of the Lord God said, no, cast that thing out, man. And there was an authority behind that. Not in my name. I was standing there in the name of the Lord Most High. It was like David, man. I'm, I'm standing against this thing, David. And, and, and first, what is it, Samuel 17, verse 48. I come at you, Goliath, in the name of, of he used the name Yahweh Sabaoth. I come at you in the name of the one who commands the living armies of, of the heavens. You got a sword, a spear, and a javelin. Do you want to get anything else? Because I'm coming at you in the name of the one that commands the armies of heaven. And that's, see, what's backing us when you and I are being commissioned. When we are sourced by the spirit of the living God. Oh, I love that language. I, I'm t I love that language. This business of literally being sourced this is the antithesis of that. It's attempting. It's taking upon. It's grabbing it by the hand. I'll just, I'll just do it myself. Don't do that with the demonic. Don't do that with anything. And, and, and they literally attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. Listen to this. I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> My gosh. Whoa. <laughs> that was common in Ephesus. There would be these exorcists. They'd have amulets and they would have uh, incantations and they would, they would try different things. It was very common in first century, very common in, in any, any, like Ephesus that was in the shadow of Artemis, this great thing. And, this is a lot of interesting reading on this, this whole stuff. But it was, just, it was just, hey, here, let's try this one. Works for Paul. And it was seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, a Jewish chief priest. They were doing this. Verse 15, the evil spirit answered. The evil, listen, that, the name of Jesus will evoke a response. See, I get asked all the time, like, how is it that how is it that sometimes the supernatural can occur through people who are not close to Jesus because the name Jesus evokes a response do you remember in Matthew 7 verses 22 and 23 Jesus 
And he says, man, you, you can prophesy, you can do miracles. Whoo, man. But he'll say, he says, depart from me. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness is, is a word that, that literally means to be outside of the parameters. So you're, you're not even in the parameters of God. You're, you're running basically your own race. That, that's what lawlessness is. It's, it's you're running your own race. But Jesus says this, I never knew you. And the word do, know there, I never knew you. Matthew 7, 23, I never knew you is the word gnoska. And that is a Jewish idiom for intimacy between a husband and a wife. Do you know what Jesus is saying? You, you used my name to evoke a response, but we never made love. I want to live my life as a laid down lover, man. I don't want to just use his name to get a throw. You see what I'm saying? And that's what's going on here. This is just, this is just nuts. So the evil spirit, it evoked a response. It wasn't a good one. It evoked a response. And the spirit in verse 15 says, I recognize Jesus. By the way, I recognize Jesus. The word recognize there is actually an intimate term. Like we have an intimate understanding of who Jesus is. But the second term is I know about Paul. That, that's an interesting term of knowledge, it's different from the first word, I know Paul. This term literally means we've had Paul in surveillance. It's an interesting, you got to hear this. It's a term that means we've been watching him. We know him through observation. We've been watching this guy. Now we've had our eye on him for a while and we've been watching him. And I want to say, listen to me, the enemy will watch you. We understand he watches us, but I like this term. Several expositors say it's not just having someone under surveillance, but it's actually watching someone because, listen to this, they're a source of annoyance. You know what these demons are saying? Yeah, we know. We know Jesus, man. We're not messing with that. But man, this Paul, we've been watching him because he noise the daylights out of us. He just doesn't stop. He just never quits. He just keeps preaching. He just, he just is relentless. The moment Paul gets out of bed... Uh, everything's a stir down here. And we're just, we're rattled because Paul is still doing what he does. And I think that ought to be a commentary of the church of Jesus Christ. I think that ought to be you and me, man. That we're not running from the enemy. The enemy is running from us, man. The enemy is saying, there's that Heartland Church again. They're praying. They're fasting. They're worshiping. They're going after me. They won't stop. They just won't quit. They just will not stop annoying us in hell. <laughs> oh, we're watching them. Because they just annoy us. They bug the daylights out of us. Come on, man. People say to me, it's just the devil. He's just always on my back. And I'm like, get on his back. I, I, you know, Ravenhill talked about this back in the 50s. He wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries. Remember that? And he has a chapter, Known in Hell. My goal is not to be known in hell, but if you're known in heaven, you'll be feared in hell. They'll, they'll not like you. Oh, make it so. And then verse 16, the man in whom the, was the evil spirit, look at, look, at these, look at these verbs. Leaped, subdued, and overpowered. 
leaped, subdued, and overpowered. I did a whole word study on those in, your, in, in, the, in the, this here. Phenomenal terms in, 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 in the sense of, of how the enemy just rapes people. And, and look, at the end. look at the end of verse 16. So they fled out of that house naked, and check this word out, wounded. The word wounded is where we get the English word traumatized. How many people in the church are traumatized by the enemy? She's traumatized. Come on, we're, that's, we minister to people who are, they come in through these doors, they're traumatized. Families and relationships, they're just traumatized. It's the work of the enemy. It's the work of the enemy. And our call, man, is to set them free. To bring healing. Anyway, it's just phenomenal. Well, let's, let's look at verses 11 and 12. I, I love these verses. Um, because, again, sounds like my soapbox. This is the fusion of word and spirit. Word and spirit. I was, I was thinking about this today. Gary and I had lunch today. We were talking just briefly, ever so briefly, about what happened at our church. In some some response I don't I, I can't tell you what happened it was just it was just incredible but I went on a sabbatical because I I was very disillusioned because what I saw in the scriptures was not what I was seeing in the church and I got very disillusioned and so I kind of shriveled up in my heart and I told my district superintendent of, of our of our denomination he oversees a group of churches I said I think I'm going to resign and the church was nine years old at that time. We started it in Columbus, Ohio in 1997. And so I go on a sabbatical. That's what he suggested. Go on a sabbatical. Spend some time. Make your decision. And so I thought, okay, I'll get seven weeks and then come back and resign. Anyway, on that seven weeks, I just had a radical encounter with the manifest presence of God's glory. Just fell on me and incapacitated me for three days. I just, just was overcome by his glorious presence. Came back to my church, and I, and I remember we changed the paradigm instantly. I, I, I remember standing up weeping and crying, and I, I, I said, I want to confess to you pastoral malpractice. I said, for nine years, I've tried to build a church for people and not the presence. And I want to ask you to forgive me. I was just weeping, tears running down my face. I just said, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't want people to hate us, but people are not the primary concern. His presence is. And if we get his presence, he'll take care of the people. And I didn't, I didn't understand that, guys. I didn't understand that. And, and so I was weeping. I just said, listen, you know, could we just sh shift the paradigm? Because we, like we were like a secret church. We, we did, we did a 90-minute show. And you know, drama, and it was a show, it was a, it was a package, it was a show, and it just shifted, I just said, could we change the paradigm, and everybody came to the altar, and I'll never forget, we just all cried out, God, we just want your presence, we just come, when you get all the props kicked out from underneath you, you realize nothing else matters in life but his manifest presence. Just nothing else matters. Just nothing else matters. I was so hungry. Well, I never anticipated, none of us did. When you ask the glory to come, I always tell churches now, looking back, be careful what you ask for. Because I didn't know. I didn't, we didn't, we didn't know. I was raised in a holiness church where we saw wonderful outpourings. We were called the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene at one time, guys. We really were. So I saw people run the aisles. I saw people, you know, with hankies. And I, I, I saw, it. We, we were, we really, it was crazy in the early days. So I, I was raised with that, but I had never, ever witnessed what happened 
when the glory came into our church. It was the very next Sunday, but it wasn't just the next Sunday. It was this next Sunday after that, and then the next Sunday after that, and the next Sunday after that, and the next Sunday after that. And this started in February of 2007 and lasted the entire year to this extent. It was so weighty in the atmosphere with the glory. It was so weighty. Sunday after Sunday, I was scared to go to church. And you said, well, that's funny. No, there's a holy reverence and a fear of the presence of God. It's nothing to contend with. You, you know, we can operate in the anointing, but we can't function in the glory. It's Second Chronicles 5.14 stuff where the cloud, the weight of his glory is so thick, it says the priest could not function. They, literally, if you read the grammar in Hebrew, is they couldn't stand up. It was too weighty. And it was like that. Week after week, it was just crazy. It was just, I would sit up on the platform just shaking like this because I didn't know what to do. The glory was in the house. We'd have services, guys. There would be 45, 50 people on the floor. It was just, and then, and then signs, miracles, and wonders, the power of God started manifesting. Like, like people, got, people actually got healed. Imagine that. People actually left different from the way they came. That's a novel thought, isn't it? People would throw off their braces and start dancing. Their crutches they'd throw to the floor. And, and, and in fact, we used one crutch to turn our video projector on and off when the remote didn't work. It was just like, yeah, it's a nice tool. We'll just start using it. It's just, and, and all the manifestations of 1 Corinthians 12 started happening. All of them. There's nine of them. They all started happening. We suddenly, veil came off and we suddenly became prophetic. I would literally stand up and say there's seven people dealing with this. There's two people dealing with this. I'd have prophetic dreams. I would literally sit down with people and say, are you going to meet this person at BP filling station next Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? How'd you know? Well, I had a dream. It was, so, it, was just, it was just all of this, all of this. And you have to understand, I'm a, I'm, so, so Pentecostal Nazarenes, that was our name, but we're still, I always say we're charismatics with a seatbelt on. We just, I didn't know what to do. And so I had two charismatic friends, and I would call them on the phone and and I would, I would say, yeah, th th it, oh, we're getting wrecked. And then here's what they would do. More, God, more. And I would, like, to hang the phone up. And I was like, you know, you're, they're laughing at me. Give them more, God. Give them more. And I'm like, I don't want, man, are you serious? They're wanting more. And I said, you, I, if any more, I'm going to die. It's crazy. It's, it's, I left my shoulder bag in the sanctuary and went in to get it. And, and I walked in at like 3 in the afternoon, and I was like, I just want to get my bag, God. I just. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? It was thick. And that was the vision that God gave me. Rob, there's not any delineation between word and spirit. The deeper you go in my word, the greater you can ride in the things of the Spirit. Because I was a word guy. I'm an expositional preacher. I've always been an expositional preacher. Man, I want to get in. What's the, I don't care what your opinion is. What's this say? That's what I want to know, man. I mean, come on, if we can't get into this, you know, people call me and they'll, they'll send stuff. I told you, you know, I get these interesting comments, but, but no one wants to talk Scripture. I don't want to hear your opinion. Have you got a scripture for me? I want to learn. If you got a scripture, let's talk scripture. I don't want to talk your opinion. I want to talk some theologian down the street. I don't want to talk about what you read. I want to know what's in the word. What's in the word, man? Let's get into the text. And what I've learned is, is the deeper you can go, the higher you can fly. It's, it's just, it's, that's what I've learned. Word and spirit. They work cooperatively. 
The dove, the Holy Spirit has two wings, word and spirit, word and spirit, word and spirit. And that was the vision. That was what God said to me in 2007. Because everything that was happening, you see, I found it in this. And a few, like a year later then is when it was prophesied over Cindy and me by a guy by the name of Randy Clark. You're going to be used to redig the wells in the holiness movement, man. You're going, to, you're, you're going to be tether people to this and teach them how to flow in the spirit. And so that's been this whole deal. Guys, listen, and I see it. Now, I'm not forcing it. I see it in the scriptures. And it's right here in this text. And we looked last night at what Paul was doing in terms of the word, where he was literally just sharing the word. In verse 10, it took place for two years. He was reasoning daily, two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word, both Jews and Greeks. Do you know what one scholar's estimate of the population of Asia was in first century? Two and a half million people. Be two and a half million people in first century heard the word because one guy was relentless to keep sowing it. Now watch this. He's dispensing the word. Now look at verse 11. Verse 11 says God was performing. Now, now stop right there. In the Greek, there's a, there's a, a conjunction, T-E, te, is how you'd pronounce that. And most of the time in the New Testament, it gets translated this way, and, A-N-D. Sometimes it gets translated as then, a few times. But to be fair, the sentence, and it's at the beginning of the sentence, it would say, Paul was preaching the word, preaching the word, preaching the word. So all who heard in Asia, they all heard the word. Then God was performing, as if he preached the word for two years, and then God started performing. The problem is, is Te gets translated and more times than not in the New Testament. And so scholars lean toward the idea that as Paul was preaching the word, God was performing miracles. Paul was preaching the word and God was performing miracles. Word and spirit. So, so, so Paul, Paul just did what he was called to. Check this out. Check this out. Go, to, go real quick to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. They're being, they're being persecuted, right? Um, Peter and John, uneducated, untrained. They're being persecuted. And, and, and so they get threatened. And, and, and so they get released in Acts 4, verse 29. Um, and here's what they say. This is upon their releasing of, of, from the Sanhedrin of being threatened. You, you guys can't keep preaching this stuff anymore. Verse 29, here's, here's what they, their prayer is. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. I like that. In other words, you take note of it. We're not going to be bothered by it. You take note of their threats. Grant that your servants, your bond servants, look at this, may speak your word with confidence. What are they saying? We want to just continue to articulate and communicate the gospel with unction. That's, that's what we're going to focus on. And then while we do that, verse 30, while we do that, you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. So we're the instruments, Romans 6 verse 13. We're the instruments that just do what we're called to do, man. We don't chase after signs and wonders. We don't, we're not people, well, where are they? I want to I do this stuff. Stop all that. Chase after God. Desire to be sourced by the Spirit and you will become an instrument whereby God can flow through you and extraordinary supernatural things will happen through your hand. That you're not looking for them. You're, you're not conjuring them up, you see. The big deal is you just operating in the fullness of his presence and doing what he has assigned you to do. If you do that, he will back up the preaching of the word with signs, miracles, and wonders. It's impossible for the word of God to be accurately communicated and there not be signs to back it up. 
I'm not sure we've heard the gospel if the gospel is not followed by God demonstrating the authority of what's been delivered through signs, miracles, and wonders. It's just the nature of this whole word and spirit thing. And, and so here's Paul. He says, look, I, I just... I'm preaching the word, and as he's preaching the word, what I see happening is, is the power of God for two years just backing up what Paul is saying. Now you understand, Ephesus is no stranger to power. They saw a lot of freakish stuff, man. This is the seedbed for the demonic, but they had never witnessed the power of God like this. And you never have to hang your head in shame. You, you never have to feel overwhelmed or intimidated. In fact, in Philippians 1, what is it, verse 27, it says, We are not intimidated by the enemy. Want one bit, man. Don't you dare be intimidated by how ungodly a world is. Understand who you are and whose you are. And if you walk in the identity of who you are as a son and daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ and do what you're assigned to do, God is going to back you up, man, and show himself off through you. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be intimidated, man. You can walk right up to people and prophesy, lay hands on them, speak words of knowledge. Extraordinary things can happen through you, man. Just do what you're assigned to do. Just do what you're assigned to do. And people are like, ah, why, why, does, why don't I get these words of knowledge? Why don't I? Just, just walk into Walmart and start loving people. Watch what happens. Come on, man. Graham Cook said, start a conversation with everyone you see and let the Holy Spirit get you out of it. Just See, I don't go to Walmart for miracles. I go to Walmart to love people. And when I love people, God can't resist to show up in that atmosphere and demonstrate himself. Do you see what I'm saying? Just go there and love people. And God says, oh. This is what's going on here. Paul's just backing him up. God was, and, and, and note the, and God was performing. Not Paul. And by the way, the word performing is the verb poeo. And, and poieo is a term for creation. It's, it's used different, way, different contexts in the New Testament. But poieo in this context is creative. And so, so scholars believe this was actually God was creating. God was doing creative miracles. I was, I was part of a cohort. You guys know with 18 people when I got my doctorate. And they were from around the world. and Just incredible. Oh, my, I was humbled with the people who, who I was with. There were some missionaries from Africa. And so you'd know who they are, but it doesn't matter. I, I, the, he was telling about his wife was going to a conference there in Africa. And, and she was kind of hustling, you know, trying to get there late. You know, late, not as late as she was always late. But anyway, she was, this is going to be. And she saw this, this, uh, this woman. She was sitting out in front of her hut. And, and her heart was drawn to her. And she couldn't resist. And she, she went up to her and she said, darling, you're, you're, you're looking down. Why? And when she lifted her head like this, she noticed she had no eyes. And she said, what is your name? And, and the woman basically in her dialect says, I don't have a name. And the reason why is, is because that tribe did not name people who had any kind of a problem, anything, because if a name meant something, and if you were lame, you didn't mean anything. She started to cry. The husband's telling him this. He's telling our, our group this. She starts to cry. The missionary. And she just pulls her into her arms and holds her. And she says, it's not true. You have a name. You have a name. 
and you are valued in the heavens. And Father knows who you are. And, and, and she just ministered to, just holding her, saying this for maybe 25, 30 minutes, right? Just holding her. And when she gets done weeping and praying over her and blessing her, she pushes back, and there's two beautiful brown eyes right there. She's seen for the first time in her life. She's. We call that a creative miracle. I love all miracles, but I think God still wants to do creative miracles. I just do, guys. I, I just... I just believe he wants to do creative miracles. Pueyo, creative miracles. And if that's not enough, God was performing extraordinary. And extraordinary in Greek is not ordinary. So that's, it's like, these are not ordinary. You know, Luke's penning this. They're, they're not ordinary. They're just like, they're not ordinary. They're just not ordinary. So basically, this is not what Ephesus had ever seen. See, the world has no idea. See, the world thinks it's operating with power, but it's demonic in nature. And you think demonic power is greater than the power of God? God is, is, it isn't a battle between God and, and, and the devil. That's not, that happened 2,000 years ago, and the enemy lost. But sometimes the enemy tries to intimidate God's people to make them think that we're inferior. But in reality, I'm telling you, if you understand that you're operating from a kingdom perspective, being sourced by the power of the Spirit, you have nothing to fear. Come on, gang. You have nothing to fear. And I, sometimes this still happens to me. I went into a store one time, and, and, I, and I saw this, this, this guy with... Cancers, like it was huge off the cheek. It was like big. And I thought of prompting, let's just pray, let's see a miracle. And I got scared. What if he's on the next aisle? I'll pray for him. He was. I walked out of the store. Now listen, I walked out of the store. You know why? I could have prayed for someone who had a backache or maybe a knee. But in my mind... That was bigger. In my mind, you think, you think God was like, I could deal with a headache. Phew, I don't know about that one. It was only bigger in my mind. And I walked out and instantly. I felt the condemnation of the enemy. You teach this stuff, man. But, but, but here's what I felt. I felt the father pull me up to his chest and say, ah, we'll get it next time. There's no, there's no condemnation in him. Come on, man. He's not going to shame me. I'm just, I'm just telling you, there's, not, there's nothing. And then verse 12, handkerchiefs. What happened through the hands of Paul, that's very key too. Because Paul not only worked with his hands, but I, I think there's, there's that's, that's, you understand there's something that gets released through our hands. Okay, I don't need to talk much on that. But then verse 12 is interesting. Handkerchief and aprons, and, and I know through the years we've had a lot of fun with that. I'm not, I'm not selling anointed cloths at my table. Don't worry about that. Just, um, let, me just, let me just mention something as to handkerchief and aprons, why that could have happened. I, I think that was something spurred on by the Jewish mindset. L let me show you real quick. Just, just look at this real fast, and, and then I'm going to wrap up with a story. Go, go to Mark. Go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And Mark chapter 5, verse 25. This is a woman with a hemorrhage for 12 years, had endured much at the hands of many physicians and spent all she had, and she was not being helped. She was actually growing worse. Okay, look at verse 27. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd 
And look at this. She touched his cloak. Verse 28, for she thought, actually she was decreeing. That word thought is lego. She literally was saying out loud. Something about confessing your faith out loud. Anyway, she thought she was saying, if I touch his garments, I'll get well. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. Why the garments? Well, there's several places in the Old Testament, like in Ruth chapter 3, verse 9, where Ruth said to Boaz, spread your garment. It's the Hebrew word kanoth. It was believed that the garment, the, the kanoth, the, the prayer shawl, actually had the authority of the one who possessed it. She was literally saying, put your authority on me. In Ezekiel 35, when a covenant was made, God said to Israel, I'm going to spread my skirt over you, my garment, my kanoth, and I'm going to cover your nakedness. I'm going to give you my authority. You won't be abandoned anymore. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, when the son of righteousness comes, there'll be healing in his wings, kanoth, garment. Do you think this woman pushed through the crowd and got her miracle because she had more faith than everyone else that was bumping up against Jesus and didn't get anything? No one who bumped up against him put a demand on him for his anointing. But here comes one woman pressing through the crowd in her social embarrassment and reached out and grabbed the cloak. Luke says she grabbed the fringe, which is the kanaf, which is the border of the prayer shawl. She pushed through and grabbed the kanaf. That's so sacred, David wouldn't even, he felt bad when he snipped it off of King Saul. See, there's, there's, there's a lot in this. You understand? So, so I'm, I'm not advocating that we need to anoint our shirts and stuff. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, hear what I'm saying. I'm also trying to tell you is that there's something about the anointing that transcends and it just gets on stuff. Did you see what I'm saying? In fact, if you go to Chapter 6, verse 56. Chapter 6 of Mark, verse 56. Wherever he entered villages or cities or countrysides, they were laying the sick in the marketplace and imploring him that they might just touch the, the fringe of his cloak. And look, and many as touched, they were cured. I mean, the dead bones of Elisha raised someone from the dead. I'm not advocating that we go lay on graves. I'm just, there's something about the anointing that transcends our minds, man. This is called the supernatural. You can't put it in a box. You, you can't, there's a mystery to it. it I, it's like, if you can explain it, it's probably not supernatural. And Acts Five, fifteen. Peter's just walking down the street, man. There's so many people coming to faith. They can't get people to Pastor Pete. So they conjure up an idea. Well, what if we bring them out on cots and lay them near Pete that when he's passing by, his shadow will fall on them and they'll get healed. And they did. Now I looked up the word shadow. And it just means shade. I was like, oh, come on, that's, that's all? The big deal is, is that his shadow might fall. That's the word epischiazo. That's the verb that Mary standing before the angel of the Lord and saying, how am I going to get pregnant in Luke chapter 1? And the Lord says, angel says, oh, the power of God is going to 
overshadow you. Same word. And the word overshadow means to fall on someone and stir up life in them. Peter was so anointed with the manifest presence that when he walked through the crowd, what was on Peter got on people around them and stirred up life. I think you and I can carry the presence of God and walk into places and people start to feel the presence of God because you walked in carrying him on your shoulders, man, and you release what you were full of. It just got on people. It's the supernatural. It's the supernatural. I think that way every time I go into a place of public arena. Every time I think, oh God, God, just walk down the aisle and let people get out of wheelchairs, man. Let people just get healed and delivered and set free. Why? Because I walked in there carrying Him. It's the supernatural. I'm a tool, I'm an instrument, I'm a weapon. Oh, I'm lethal. Do you guys understand that? Every one of you, young and old, you're dangerous people. I don't know how to say it any plainer. God wants to use every one of you. Oh. It's just remarkable. It's just remarkable. So let me wrap up with this. One of my favorite stories, we were doing ministry in Jamaica. We had a team of four. We did 13 services in nine days. Something like that. I just went around doing these outpourings. It was incredible. Outpouring. Praise God. By the way, we went to Jamaica during a drought. And someone prophesied that the Spirit of God is going to follow you like a downpour. Almost every single place we ministered, it rained. And I'm telling this story, and it's raining. Anyway, so we, it's phenomenal. Our very last service outside of Montego Bay, we, we go up into, it took us an hour to get up in there in a little van. And when we get to this church, the music in the bar was so loud, it was thumping. The van was going, boom, boom, boom. and they're playing their reggae, and, you know, they've got, they're, they're smoking, they're, they're drinking. They have open windows, no windows, just an open window in Jamaica. And that's, the church is here, so it's only like 25 feet church bar. And that's the happening place. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's just, it's. So we get out of the van and, you know, and a couple of our guys start talking with some of the dudes there, you know, and. They're like, hey, the Bob Marley lookalikes. And we go inside. And, and I remember we, we tried to start the service. But I, true story, we're standing in a circle. And there's maybe 12, maybe 15 we're standing in a circle. And we try to get started. A couple of people have some tambourines and they start singing. But it's, it's literally being drowned out. And it's, it, what we're doing is being drowned out because that's, that's the parte. I mean, that's, that's where it's happening, right? It's, and, you know, I think of that parenthetically. That's, that's what the picture of a lot of churches. We're being drowned out by the culture. Well, the four of us are wired. This is our last service, and it's just been off the chain. This is our last service, so we're just, you know, they're trying to sing, you know, the music, and we're just, we're plugged in, man. We're just doing what we're assigned to do. Father hasn't let, let us down yet. And pretty soon, one of the guys whew, hears from heaven. He says, hey, God spoke. Got everyone quiet. He says, God spoke to me. He says, here's what we're to do. He says, I'm to anoint somebody with oil. We'll anoint them. And they're going to get healed. As soon as they get healed, I'm going to give them the oil. They're going to become the prayer person for the second person. They're going to pray for the second person. The second person is going to get healed. And then they're going to give the oil to the second person. And the first and second are going to be the prayer persons for the third person. 
Then the third person is going to get healed. Then the first, second, and third will pray for the fourth person. The fourth person will get healed. Then we're going to give the fourth person the oil, and the first, second, third, fourth, and you see where this is going, right? So he said, who, who wants to be first? The lady says, what's me? He just took oil, put it on her forehead. He says, be healed. That's all he said. He says, be healed. And the power of God touched her. She goes, oh, I mean, just boom. And she's like, well, here's the oil. Don't get excited. You're praying next. She turns around and says, who's next? Someone who came up. And by golly, the second person, bam, they got healed. And then, and then the third. And then the fourth. And then the sixth. And then the eighth. And then the twelfth. And then the 15th, and, and the thing kind of got out of hand. They broke protocol. They, some slipped over here and started anointing and praying. And, and a couple over here was anointing and praying. Someone spilled oil, so now there's oil all over the floor. So they're wiping their hands in it. And it just kind of keeps going. And, and then I'm kind of looking around, and, and, and I'm, I'm looking at a woman in her 70s doing this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Over here is an old guy going, wow, 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 wow. And it's just, and then this guy comes in, he's drunk, he's stumbling all over the place like this. He didn't know what was going on. Man, they get on him, they start slapping oil all over him. He instantly sobers, just sobers up. We give him the oil. You gotta pray, dude. And so he turns around, prays for the girl who's his sister. They haven't talked to each other in two years. They reconcile, starts crying. Oh, sister, I'm so sorry. Then the two of them become a prayer team. They start praying for people. There's three guys coming in from the bar, young people who had never been to church. They're sitting in the back. They come. They get born again. We pour water over their heads because baptism is a big deal in Jamaica. We give them oil. They start praying for people. Now, I lost track of time. I did. I was just like, this was so much fun. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, I'm not hearing the music anymore. And I look in the windows of the church, and the people from the bar are standing in the window looking in the church because the happening place is not the bar. The happening place is in the church where the manifest presence of God is moving in the midst. See, that's, that's the attraction, man. Come on. You think the world is, are you serious? If they'll see an authentic demonstration of the presence and the power of God, they'll run to it. They'll run to it. And the pastor looked up. He said, come on in. Come on in. And they did. Now listen. Three and a half hours later, we finished that service. Are you ready for this? We counted. We counted. There were 85 people in this little church. And most of them were born again that night. We laid hands on the pastor who's weeping. I said, well, you got a new church, dude. Just keep it up. Anointed him, laid hands on, impartation, and we left. It's a supernatural. He wants to blow through instruments like you and me. He wants to turn the mundane into the miraculous. Sign me up. Father, I thank you so much for this precious church. I'm I'm so grateful, God, for an atmosphere that is conducive to the Word and to the Spirit. I'm so thankful, Father. Church, you have to know I love this house. I I do. Listen, we're friends. And I don't say this to flatter you, but but this, this culture attracts revelation. There's no reason why you cannot have a systemic transformational change in this region in the next three to five years. I don't, I don't know if, I'm not saying it has to take that long. I'm not. Father, I, I pray. Oh, last night we all signed up, man. We all, I, I mean, 
everyone came forward. Everyone came forward. So they're in. Now I just pray that you'll be faithful, and you will, to back up the assignment with the miraculous. I, I pray, Father, the super will become natural through all these people in this room. Come on, God, I pray you'll release signs, miracles, and wonders. I, I pray, God, that God, I pray that this will be a place where the prophetic will be what Paul, or excuse me, what Peter said would be sons and daughters will prophesy. I pray, Father, words of knowledge. I pray, God, that there'll be just be, it'll be fluent, it'll flow. That this will be a house that walks in love and simultaneously is a place where the Spirit can manifest through. Come on, God, I pray that you would remove fear and intimidation. Like, like if there's anyone here, Father, if there's, there's folks that feel like, well, this has never happened with me. I'm saying tonight, God, is the turning point. It's, it's, it's the turning point. That we'll believe the truth, and the truth will literally make us free. We'll walk in this stuff. Come on, reach out. Reach out and put your hands on someone right beside you, will you? Just, just put your hands on them. Come on, Father, right now, come on, just release. Release your presence. Come on, just... Come on, pray into this. Pray into this. Come on, pray into this with me. Just pray right now. Come on, Father, source them right now. Come on, just source them supernaturally. Come on, source them supernaturally. Supernaturally, source them, God. Come on, just pray, pray, pray with me. Source them, God. Come on, may the mundane become miraculous. Because we've walked, we've walked as instruments. And the Spirit of the living God has been able to use us as a lethal weapon to destroy darkness and establish the kingdom. Come on, in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on, Father, I pray. Come on. Let, let us begin to see into people, just like Jesus in John 4. Come on, let us, not to impress people, but to transform them. In the name of Jesus, come on. The woman at the well, we, we, there's going to be someone, come on, at a filling station. There's going to be someone at a restaurant. There's going to be someone at a dollar store. That we're going to release the word, and they're going to be the hinge pin. Come on. Their family is going to be reunited. Their kids are going to be redeemed. Addictions are going to fall off. Why? Because we released the word and it came with power. It came with an anointing. And it looked like much. It was a small seed, but it became this massive garden plant because we were obedient. We were obedient. And the power of God backed up the deliverance of the word. Come on, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, just, just, just agree with me right now. Father, come on, we just sever off sickness, fibromyalgia, arthritis, migraines, TMJ. Come on, breathing problems, God, indigestion issues, God. Come on, TMJ, come on, in any, any digestive issues, no more, God, tonight, no more, God. Pain in the joints, God, in the knee, God. Pain, God, in the lower back areas, God. Hip pain, gone, God. Asthma, gone in the name of Jesus. We're not receiving it. No more, God. No more, God. Mind confusion. No more, gone, God. Clarity of thought. We have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, God. 
Come on, fear and anxiety and oppression. We're not carrying that. That's not our portion. You didn't purchase that, so we don't have to carry it. So, Father, no, no anxiety, no fear, no oppression. We're going to walk free, those whom the Son has set free. We're free indeed. We're not walking with this stuff any longer. Come on, God, we're not going to be a, we're not going to be a, like, like listen to this. Colossians 3.3 3 says we're hidden in Christ. God, I pray we'll be so hidden in you, the enemy will have a hard time finding us. Remind us tonight that we're seated in heavenly realms. That means we're far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. The enemy is under our feet. He's not on our back. May we walk in authority. May we walk, God, in kingdom authority. Not kingdom arrogance, kingdom confidence. Our confidence is in you. It's not in ourself. We're not self-sourced people. We don't live on good ideas. We live on God ideas. Come on, I thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Heartland Church. I thank you for these precious people. What you've done and what you're going to continue to do in the days ahead. In the name, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Everyone agreed? on. The Lord's deposited something in us tonight. He's taken four services just to download something in our hearts and tell us, listen, get in, get into the word, love people, and come on, nothing's impossible. Supernatural things will begin to take place. I love that imagery of just grabbing her, her grabbing that woman and just loving on her, you know, and God doing a miracle. How many times did you say Jesus had compassion on them? You know, may, maybe miracles aren't happening as frequently as we'd like to see because we're lacking compassion. We're not loving as we should. Yeah, Lord, do that in us. Come on, I just sense the presence of the Lord and you know, I was sitting on the front row, and, and here we are Tuesday night. We're going to have church again tomorrow night. Come on, somebody. And uh, and uh, Josh is going to bring the word tomorrow night. The Lord has been working on Josh about something that he's going to be preaching tomorrow night. It's going to tie right into what God has been speaking to us, these four services. And, uh, and so come believing and expecting God's got something for us tomorrow night. You know, I, I was thinking about um, what, where would we be if we weren't here right now? Well, most of us might be home and watching TV or, you know, doing something mundane or just getting through the evening, you know. And, uh, you know, in my, in my humble opinion, this is what we were made for. This, this is what we were made for. Being in this atmosphere, being in this presence, and availing ourselves to these things. Come on. So, praise the Lord. We're going to receive an offering, our last one. We're going to bless this ministry. And uh, Rob and his wonderful wife, Cindy, ministering. And so, if, you, if you're writing a check, you can make it payable to Heartland. And uh, we'll make sure that they're blessed and taken care of. God has been so good to us, these four services. Rob, thank you for coming. Thank you for your obedience. And uh, please uh, consider Heartland friends and family. And uh, you, are, uh, you are welcome here anytime, brother. You're welcome here anytime. So we love you. And uh, let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now. For your presence. God, we thank you, Lord, for this 
precious man of God for his ministry, Lord. God, we just pray, Father, blessing and strength upon him, Lord, favor upon his life. God, we speak the blessing and favor of God over him, Lord. Oh, Father, let's safe travels on his way home. Lord, as he reunites with his bride. Lord, we just pray blessing upon their marriage, their home, their grandchildren, God. Oh, Father, we're so excited to hear about what you're about ready to do, God. How they've begun a new journey. And Lord, they're just getting started. The best is yet to come. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Lord. We bless him, Father. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, God's people said amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you as you give tonight. Hallelujah. We're privileged. I know uh, we're, so, we're so blessed here in this house in so many ways. And I think, uh, I think about the flow of what God is doing and I see... Uh, hearts getting lighter. I see lives being changed. And, uh, you know, uh, we want to be, and I know Bill and Connie and and Kimber and I, we're all the same. We're we're all saying, Lord, we want you to be glorified. We want more of your presence. We want to see lives changed. We had 17 water baptized on Easter Sunday. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? Let's just have another 20. Come on, somebody. Amen. Let's just have another 20. Let's just believe God. We're going to get that thing moving, man, and uh, moving. And, uh, man, God's got such good things for us. And so, uh, Father, I just bless your people tonight as they go. Lord, we commission them, Lord. We, we feel commissioned tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. To go and to be dangerous for Jesus. To love, to love people. To pray for them. To encourage them to give them the word of God and just watch and see what you do, Lord. Oh, Lord, God, you are eager. Lord, you are eager to move in our lives. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you tonight. Be blessed as you go tonight. Amen.